Okay, so welcome to another Perspectives in AI seminar of the Center for Artificial Intelligence of the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, today's seminar is also sponsored by the Institute of Mathematics, Mathematics and Statistics here of the University of Sao Paulo. And our um, speaker today is Alessandro Antonucci, who is a senior lecturer and researcher at the Swiss lab ITSIA. He is also affiliated with the University of Lugano and the University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Southern Switzerland, where he kind of lives. He's the author of more than 100 peer-reviewed publications. He's an area editor of the International Journal of Approximate Reasoning. And he, his research interests focus on progressive graphical models, uh, machine learning, explainable why AI, and causality. So thank you very much for being here, Jason. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> thank you, everybody, for uh, for uh, coming. Uh, of course, just before uh, starting, uh, I want to thank uh, Dennis, the Institute of uh, Mathematics and the grant program of the Institute of Marime for support. I was here also attending uh, a committee, the PhD in <laughs> defense of Jolis, a master thesis. Very, very nice experience for me. I thank you, Fabio, and uh, the Institute for uh, Artificial Intelligence for giving me the opportunity to give this talk, where I try to, to let you know something about what I'm doing in research in the last two, three years. The focus is uh, causality, causal analysis. I'll start from some very general idea. But uh, so the first part of the talk will be mostly general, let's say high level, and then at some point I go to the technical uh, details. I think it makes some sense. Uh, no, it makes to me a lot of sense to do this kind of talk uh, here because there is a very strong relation between our approach to causal analysis and uh, a class of generalized graphical models an extension of uh, Bayesian network. Fabio is one of the pioneer of this uh, class of model, Fabio Kozman. Uh, these models are uh, called the critical networks. And this was also some time ago <laughs> the topic of, uh, of my PhD defense. We were trying to use this model for expert uh, system, for machine learning. Very recently, we discovered a very strong relation between causal analysis and critical networks. And today I'm trying mostly to discuss these, uh, these points. So just before starting, I want to tell you something about my institute. Uh, I'm from ITSIA. ITSIA is a Swiss AI lab. We are located in the southmost part of Switzerland, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, Lugano, is this city very close to the Italian border. I'm sure most of you is uh, asking themselves, what is this battle about? <laughs> Especially if you are young, probably you don't know. I think this drink was popular, maybe it's still popular in Brazil, <laughs> but it was very popular in Brazil, in Italy, in Switzerland. Long time ago, it's a bitter drink made of artichokes, it's called the Chinar. And the link with our institute is not we drink that <laughs> all the time, but the founder, Let's say the, the person who created this institute more than 30 years ago is this guy, Angelo Dalle Molle. Basically, he was a, for us like a philanthropist. He decided to invest some of the money he made out of this drink. Uh, it was big money, actually, in a research institute. And at that time, more than 30 years ago, the idea was to promote artificial intelligence, to promote the quality of life. The, our full name is Istituto Dalle Molle di Studi su Intelligenza Artificiale per la qualità della vita, the quality of life. So say something really <laughs> visionary idea of AI, especially at that time. Initially, a long time ago, we were an independent research institute because at the time, in this part of Switzerland, there were basically no university. Then uh, the, the two universities have been established in this part, and we are now affiliated to the university. So we are not anymore an independent research institute. We are basically a kind of department of AI of these, uh, the two universities in this part of, of Switzerland. I think we are small compared to the big department, maybe, you know, Zurich, the Polytechnic schools in Zurich, in Lausanne. We are certainly smaller, but I think we do good research. We are relatively well, well known. 
One of our now former scientific director, Jürgen Schmiduber, is one of the founder of LSTM, was one of the pioneers of deep learning. We have a big group working in uh, deep learning, but uh, we are also people working on symbolic, uh, probabilistic method, which is probably what we have in common with uh, your groups, is what uh, the link uh, somehow between our institute and uh, university and this, uh, this center. Let me also say that Dennis, Dennis Mawa, was a PhD student at, at ITSA, so we were we have been colleague for for many years. Uh, we have links. We sometimes it's not my first time uh, here in Brazil. We have a, we have a, con a connection. So let me just introduce the topic and let me say that our approach to causal analysis is based on uh, the formalism of Judea Perl. So the way we describe causality is the way Perl is uh, pro uh, proposing. So we use uh, the so-called structural causal model, which are graphical models. And somehow what we are doing now is very strongly related to what Perl did over time. Let me make this very approximated story of this, of this uh, topic. Something like in the 80s, somehow even before, you know, graphs for AI, has, graphs have been always used in AI. At some point, they were just based on uh, deterministic rules, expert system, old-fashioned expert system. At some point, people started to plug uncertainty inside this model, probabilities, and a formal description of this kind of approach was provided by Bayesian Network. And Judea Perl, with this book, with many many papers formalized some of the ideas, some of the most important inference solvent for this kind of model. These were, from a causal perspective, pure observational model. So the goal was not to capture any causal mechanism. And then if some, at some point, some people started to call them causal networks, but actually they were just describing observational, a correlational, links between the variable of, of the system. This is what Bayesian networks are doing. This, let's say, the 80s, something like that, very approximated these, uh, these dates. Then at some point, people started to be not completely happy with the pure probabilistic uh, description. Why? Because somehow they are not general enough. For instance, if the goal, and at that time, the main goal was to describe human uh, reasoning, human decision, Maybe sharp probabilities, single probabilistic value are not enough for uh, reproduce the way we reason or to reproduce some soft approach to reasoning. So at some point, people started to extend. Maybe you heard the fuzzy approaches. Fuzzy approaches have been proposed more or less at that time and lots of other different approaches. Maybe some of you heard about uh, Dempster Schaefer evidence theory, fuzz, uh, no, sorry, fuzzy said, uh, possibilistic theories. There are lots of proposals. Some of the most general one is the one where we, the most general is also the simplest, is the one where instead of a single distribution, you consider a set of distribution. And this is not a hierarchical model. It's not that you have a set of distribution and you have a distribution over the distribution. It's really just a set of distribution because you are not able to say which one is the true one because of your partial ignorance about the system, because of your lack of knowledge, you have to cope with all the distributions simultaneously. And what you can do is only compute bounds, lower and upper bounds, with respect to your, the ignorance you have about the fact that you don't know which one is the true distribution described in your model. This is in a very loose way what uh, imprecise probabilistic, or also called the creedal approaches are doing. And at that time, some people started to extend Bayesian networks to critical probability. So basically replacing the local parameters of a Bayesian network, the single distributions, distribution, with sets of distribution, or called critical set. Fabio is the person who formalized all this idea. He wrote in 2000 this paper, critical networks, and this was basically the formalization of this generalized probabilistic model. Why well, somehow the idea was still observation. And this model were not, this is Zaffalon, Marco Zaffalon was my supervisor in, uh, in Lugano. We did also some work together on, on, on the topic. And the idea was still to describe the correlation between the variable in this generalized sense, but still without any causal flower. In parallel, in the meanwhile, Judea Perl moved on 
So from uh, Bayesian networks description, pure observation, uh, he moved uh, to causal model. And uh, one of the most important results, he wrote many books, did many. These, I think these are the books. He wrote many papers, <laughs> an unbelievable amount, an impossible to follow number of, of papers, but uh, he summarized most of this idea in these books so over time. And in his books, basically, in the second book, basically, he started to formalize the cause, his approach to causal analysis, and he presented the do calculus. And the do calculus is basically computing a causal query by reducing the causal query to an observational query. So I'm interested in a causal mechanism, but I only have data that comes from an observation. Still, in some cases, not always, I can answer a causal query. So I can compute, uh, I can say that uh, this uh, is causally affecting this or something, uh, something like that. So the do calculus is basically reducing causal analysis to observational analysis, something I can answer by using the data, the data I collect from some uh, observation. Of course, there are limitations, and at some point he moved up, we'll see in which sense he moved up, and the most uh, recent, let's say, books, also papers, are focused in uh, full formalism, a complete formalism, which is that of structural causal model. I will mention very soon the counterfactual idea, which is the, the key point of this uh, general approach. And this is what Per did. What we are trying to do, what this talk is trying to do, is to show you that this generalized, this complete description of causality, causality a la Perl, can be also achieved by means of this formalism of critical network. And somehow, what for a lot for a lot of time we try to derive in terms of inference algorithm, in terms of uh, modeling of different quantification of Cridal's network can be used for a deeper understanding of causal analysis. This is somehow the the framework. Okay, just before uh, before starting, uh, this is some uh, personal. Actually, it's kind of a personal comment about the the trend uh, in AI. So it's really personal. I use uh, the the opinion of other people just to to make my my point, but it's really something uh, something personal. Maybe. So we are young, you are very excited about deep learning. <laughs> and this maybe now is already a bit changing. Maybe a few years ago was even stronger. But uh, what, what I just want, wanted to say is that, uh, okay, the success of deep learning is uh, amazing. It's, it's really amazing what, uh, what deep learning is, is doing nowadays. But for some people, and let me use <laughs> the word of Perl, which are <laughs> much more heavy than, uh, uh, than, than mine, it's not that surprising because what we are discovering is that, uh, okay, if we have a, a lot of data, if we have the good formalism to capture the correlation between some variables and some other variables, we can do very accurate predictions. We are discovering that some activities like uh, vision, computer vision is not solved, but uh, the, the progress in the field of computer vision are amazing. And we can probably now start to say the same for the field of natural language processing, natural language understanding. So these activities related to the human, to the human are complicated, but somehow they are based on a function that can be approximated very well. You probably studied that uh, neural networks are universal approximators. So you just need a sufficient amount of data. This amount of data is crazy, but it's not impossible. So you need a lot of money, you need hardware, you need to collect a lot of data, but eventually you can do something like uh, chat GPT, you can do something which is very good for computer vision. This is exciting. Yes, this is definitely exciting, but we can do more. Somehow we, can, we should be more ambitious. So we should be interested also in capturing uh, causal relation. If you want causal relation is what science did all the time. Of course, it's not at all a new topic, but in data science is emerging as something important because so far data science focused on capturing the statistical relation with the variable, which is important, but which might be, not be enough. Okay. So this is a picture from, uh, from Perl, and it's just to say the, the three different levels is uh, known as the ladder of causation of coding to Perl. It's just to say that what we are doing when we are capturing correlation, what we do when we use uh, 
deep learning. What we are doing when we use Bayesian network to, for some reason, is on the first level and is about association. So we are capturing and we are learning correlation. But we can do more. So for instance, we can move to the second level. And the second level is about intervention. So it's not just that I observe a variable to be in this state, and given this observation, I can say that it's very likely that the second variable will be in this state. I can do an action and I can force this variable to be in that state. And the two things are not equivalent, at least in general. So this is computing the effect on an intervention of your system. And you need a different formalism. The standard, you cannot use directly a Bayesian network to compute this second level. Basically, you need, at least in a Paris approach, the causal graph. So you need also to, to have a causal understanding of the relation between this, the variable, which can be qualitative, can be a graph, a directed graph, but you need that. Otherwise, you cannot answer in general this kind of query. And the third level, the most ambitious one, is the counterfactual one. And the counterfactual just means is a what if question. So you in you are observing something, but you ask you, and you know that given this something, something else happened, but you ask yourself about what would be happened in another world where the observation would be different. And this looks from one side uh, a bit esoteric, so thinking about an alternative world. But in practice, it's what we do a lot. So we have this and we think, what would be the alternative? And then it's not just uh, computing independent the two worlds, the real one and the alternative one, and take the unit, the product of that. This is, in certain cases, this can be right, but not in general. So we need dedicated tools, which are the tools of causality. And my point here is that uh, this uh, formalism, this graphical formalism of critical network with this critical idea of the set of distribution without any second order distribution is what we might use to approach this problem. Okay, this is just to say that we are working to this field with colleagues of mine at Itzia. We also have a software which for the moment is in Java, which is probably at this time is really not, uh, not best. We are converting to, <laughs> to Python, of course, and some C++ and Gene, but uh, at the moment it's still uh, Java, but uh, there is some documentation. Just to say that we also have, we have papers I can send you if you're interested, we have software. But let me go to the point. This is a simple slide. This is the first technical, not too technical. Somehow this is the most important slide for me of this talk. If you understand this, I'm happy. I can even stop, uh, stop now. So let's say that we have a Boolean variable and is endogenous. I use this term. Endogenous for me is basically like manifest, it's observable, it's something I can observe, no? So there is something in the world I can, I can observe, it's a Boolean variable, a coin or whatever. And I collect observation. In the traditional way, I have a data set of observation. I toss my coin or whatever, so I have a data set. You start statistics, uh, we have lots of statistical techniques to learn a statistical model over these variables. So let's say we learn a distribution any kind of no of distribution okay that's uh, what uh, people is doing with Bayesian networks no that's it okay it's not single variable multivariate but the idea is that now let's say that uh, we have another variable which is exogenous which is uh, hidden which is latent we don't observe this variable but this variable exists this variable has four states whatever and okay, this is really nothing. But, and here is the point, this latent variable is determining the states of these latent variables are through an equation, I use this f of x, are determining the state of x. So x, what we observe in the reality, and I think this was, okay, it's not only by Perl, but this was introduced by Perl, I think it has something to do with his metaphysical ideas <laughs> related to, Okay, to other, to other non-scientific stuff. But okay, basically the point is that I have a latent variable and the state of this latent variable is determining the state of what I observe. Here are four states, I don't know, the first two states of the latent variable goes to the first state of the observable variable and the third and the fourth state 
of this latent variable go to the second state of the observable pattern. Some mechanism. We call this equation. And the idea is that what we observe is the result of the deterministic process. So why we experience uncertainty? Because there might be uncertainty over on the latent world. So the idea is just to move the uncertainty to a second layer, which is latent. We observe something. What we observe is the result of a deterministic process, but <coughs> the in, the, uh, in this deterministic process, this deterministic process is driven by latent variable we cannot observe. So the uncertainty we observe, we, we experience, is the uncertainty on the latent variables. This is somehow the idea of these approaches to causal modeling. And we call this a structural equation. Okay, some mathematical, ideally we want the function to be subjective, which means that and we can observe any possible value of this, uh, of this variable. Okay, uh, if you know probability theory, total probability, what is this P of X? What is the probability of X? Of course, we can condition on you, <coughs> and we can uh, consider the probability of X given you, weight by the probability of u, and the sum of, uh, sorry, this, uh, this is a typo, so this is a sum over u. The sum over u of p of x given u times p of u is the probability of x. So that's nothing, but the probability of x given u is modeling basically the relation between x and u, and the relation between x and u is deterministic. So this conditional probability is a zero one distribution. That's why here I'm using the delta. And this is the relation. So the P of X, so for instance, I toss my coins, sorry, and I observe a probability for one of the states, 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is the sum weighted by this delta coefficient of the probability of U, of the four probability of U. Okay. Now, I don't know P of U. I know P of X, but I don't know P of U. But this relation is a constraint between P of X and P of U. This relation in this modeling is a linear constraint between P of X and P of U. Okay? So if I know P of U, I can compute P of X. If I know P of X, I can just constrain P of U. But this is the best I can do. If my final goal is to learn P of U, the best I can do is to use what I know from the observable world to define this number and constrain the value of P of U. Generally speaking, this relation is many to one. So I'm kind of inverting the relation. So the, the inverse relation will be one to many. And this basically means that there will be multiple P of U compatible with the P of X. You see? So basically, for instance, uh, any, this, so this is P of U, there are four numbers, because of, uh, U has uh, four states, any quantification of this small P, any this quaternary distribution like this one, will reproduce the probability of X equal to P, this one. And this basically means that my knowledge about X, my precise knowledge, my distribution, based on statistical analysis about X, becomes just a constraint on P of U. And the, the P of U that I should consider as admissible is not a single one, it's a set of them. It's what I was calling a cradle set of distribution. So if for some reason I have access to the latent world and I can compute P of U, this model will be a Bayesian network. But in most of the, of, of the situation, I only have access, access to the X. And so what I do is to reverse this relation and to quantify sets over the Latin variables. And this is not a Bayesian network, this is a CRIDA network. So this, this was really my point. This is the intimate connection between structural causal models and CRIDA networks. What is my point is that by observing this uh, relation, we can use what we did in the past, for instance, for inference, to do causal analysis, to do causal inference. We can use critical network inference. We spent many years trying to develop uh, good arguments for critical networks to compute the critical, to compute causal inference. 
Okay, so this is, was really a minimalistic example. Uh, okay, in the literature you can find lots and also lots of lots of uh, examples. Of course, generally speaking, you have multiple variable on the latent level, multiple variable on the observable layer. You have you might have complicated graphs. There are different notation. You might have continuous variable. <laughs> you might have uh, discrete variables, whatever. So in general, you will have a distribution over the X and the U. The U, we typically assume the U to be on the top, to be the root of the graph and to be independent. This is an assumption called the semi-Markovian. The rest is based on the equation, so this is the kind of distribution we cope with. And given this object, this is all what we need to compute any causal query on the system. So we can ask for all the three levels of the hierarchy of uh, Julia, Julia Perl. So uh, this was high level view. Now let me let me invest. at some point you should stop me and just <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't hesitate. And also if some moment you have a question. So this was something I wanted to really to, to tell you. Now something uh, more specific. Okay, this slide for me is really just to to motivate the fact that okay, observable data are not enough to answer the kind of uh, query we might have. Uh, so. This is a system, classical system, a classical example. I take a drug or whatever. I want to see whether this is effective or not effective. And I have data, observational data. It's not that I did a clinical trial, something like that. I just collect data. So what can I do? I can just compute the conditional probability for the two cases, taking the drug, not taking the drug, and to see whether the effect is significant. This is what some people, a lot of people is doing, but it's very dangerous it's, because you might obtain unreliable conclusion out of that. Maybe something like that happened for the vaccine <laughs> some time ago. <laughs> and okay, uh, this image is from uh, the book of Penn. I don't know if you know that. It's like, uh, this is uh, the amount, some data about the amount of exercise and the amount of cholesterol. And it seems that the more you exercise, the more uh, cholesterol you have. So if I just analyze this data in these uh, observations, in this uh, statistical sense, I should stop uh, doing any exercise, otherwise my cholesterol will, <laughs> will go <laughs> crazy. <laughs> what is the, the trick? The trick is that there are, if you take into account some covariate, if you condition, for instance, this data with respect to the age, you will see something like that. And for these different categories of data, you will see, a bit naive, but okay, of course, that the more exercise, the lower is the cholesterol. And the only point is that maybe older people at some point, at some point, they, this is my interpretation, I'm not sure, but at some point older people, they get scared, so they start to do exercise because, they, <laughs> and so they do more exercise than the, well, the, the you see, anyway, this is, uh, and this is related to what some people call the Simpson paradox. And there are lots of examples related to the so-called Simpson paradox. But it's just to say, we are not happy standing only on the observational level. So let's go to the interventional. And let me just say that what intervention are doing, or let me better to say that uh, the way you can model intervention in these kind of, of models, of structural causal model, is basically I force a variable to be in a state. If I force my variable x to be in the state of small x, the equation of my variable disappears. So I'm just replacing the equation with a constant equation, with an equation that no matter what are the other variables, always give me this small x. So it's like you change the graph. Some people call this surgery. You are modifying it. But once you did that, this is a standard model, so you can use the, the general machinery of graphical models to do your computation. So it's a kind of very natural way to embed the intervention and to compute interventional queries, which is already on the second level. Then, uh, okay, this is just uh, to, to say that uh, do calculus, the do calculus of Perl is mostly focused on these queries, and what the do calculus is trying to do is to reduce these queries to observational queries. So to this kind of queries, where you have only probabilities. It's basically a qualitative technique. It's very simple also to be implemented. 
compute then the output of an intervention might be not trivial, but deciding whether or not you can do that is relatively simple and is a sound and complete technique. So you really know, given the graph, you can really decide whether or not you can do something like that. If you can do something like that, eventually you obtain a Bayesian network and you compute the result of your query in the Bayesian network. The approach is sound and complete, so you really know when this is possible, but if this is not possible, you are in troubles. There is nothing you can, uh, you, you can say. And for a lot of time, people start, and these are called the so-called non-identifiable queries. There are queries, even interventional queries, that you cannot answer with the calculus. Why you cannot answer? Basically because uh, you can prove that it's not possible. It's not possible to reduce them to an observational point. So there is no way to compute this number. But from a deeper perspective, the fact that you cannot answer this query is related to the fact that, that there is no a single number describing the result of this query. But generally speaking, there are multiple numbers. There is an interval describing this query. And for us, now that we know that there is this cradle machinery, this is not at all surprising. So we have a set of distribution. Different distribution can give you different answers to the query. Is it a problem? Technically, it's a bit a problem. It's, it's more complicated. We need to compute the bounds, but it's not at all surprising. This is the case for some uh, interventional query. This is almost always the case for counterfactual query. So if you are interested in counterfactual analysis, you need to cope with this, what they call partial identifiability of your query. So you need to estimate intervals for your query. And uh, this is what people is trying to do and what we are trying to do a lot in the last uh, three years. Generally, these people is three, four, five years ago. This is a guy actually is from Brazil, but he's in, he was uh, the PhD student of Julia Perl, now he's in uh, Colombia. I would say at least Baron Boyne is the guy doing the most important things nowadays in this, uh, in this uh, field. He has a really strong, uh, strong group. We try also to, to move, we have some relation also with them, but he's really doing strong, uh, strong things. And now the challenge for all these groups is to find a good way to compute these bounds. And this is also what we are trying to do. And we want to use CRIDA networks for that. So the counterfactual question we, we, we want to answer is something like, OK, in the real world, I took the aspirin and my edge was uh, disappeared. What would be in an alternative world where I didn't took the aspirin? Is my edge, which is the probability of my edge disappearing? These are counterfactual probabilities. To answer such a counterfactual probability, you cannot use the calculus. You cannot do observational analysis. You need more complicated machinery. Basically, you have to build what people call counterfactual network, or in this simple case, twin network. It's like you duplicate the observable variable, the X variables. There is the real world, where I did this, and the alternative world, where I did something else. So I duplicate these variables, but in a coherent model, and in this coherent model, I have the same latent variables. So this is twin network, counterfactual network, and you need this object for this kind of computation. If you have the latent distribution over the U variables, you are done. But generally speaking, you don't have them. We have this critical set, and so we need to compute this inference. Now, let me be faster. So, uh, okay, now this is an example, but I think I, I, I will skip uh, the, the detail of the example. I just want to, to tell you that uh, this idea of uh, inverting the relation, inverting the structural equation of the model, I showed you with a single variable. With multiple variable, is more complicated because with multiple variable, I have different latent distribution. You see this P of U, A, U, B, U, C, U, D. And the constraint is mixing distribution. So in my first example, the constraint was linear. Here, the constraint is non-linear. And the constraint is mixing variables from different parts of the network. So in a sense, it's global. What we did, and we have a technical paper about that, is to decompose these global and non-linear set of constraints 
into local and linear constraints. So basically, what we did is decompose this in this. And so these are uh, non-linear and global. These are local and linear. And so this is basically naturally defining a, a credal network. So it's really just a decomposition procedure. <coughs> Once I have that, I have a credal network. And with a credal network, I can answer the queries by using inference argument for credal networks. Is something I can do all the time, not always, because I need the kind of, uh, it depends on how are located these U variables. So we have a concept, there is a technical concept of quasi Markovianity. There are cases in which I have the latent variables are not too, <laughs> too dense, let me say like that, and we can trivially use credit network inference. In the general case, this I think I can skip, this is really just about the way we do the computation. So for this kind of graphs, we can easily do the credal network mapping. But in the general case, we cannot. And when we can, oh, we have a software for that. This is just. But when we cannot decompose the constraints, the global constraints into linear constraints, in principle, we can merge this latent variable into a single one. But this is clearly not scalable. So. At some point, we faced this, uh, this problem. We were very excited about this, uh, this relation, but uh, we faced a, an obvious scalability problem. So we moved, uh, uh, we tried to find some approximate solutions so, uh, to this problem. And this also, uh, to skip, sorry, I have about a lot of material, but this I will mention later. But uh, what I want to show you now is this. And actually, we, we consider an EM approach. Not sure uh, you all started, but the EM is basically when you cope with missing data. And the intuition is very simple. We have data about the observable variable, variables, and by definition, we don't have data about the latent variable. Systematically, they are not because they are latent. We cannot observe them. In the statistical jargon, this will be, they are missing at random. They, they're missing uh, because they should be missing. EM can complete this data set. And if I complete this data set, I can learn the distribution over the U, and then I'm done. We can do that. Of course we can do that. But uh, where are the guarantees? To have guarantees, we need to show, because the EM can be proved to converge to, the, the EM has the goal to maximize the likelihood of what we observe. And this is what most of the time people do to learn a statistical model. But the EM is only finding a local maximum of the likelihood, which can be a suboptimal estimate, which can be for us a very unreasonable estimate. What we managed to prove uh, is that the likelihood for this model has a single global maximum, so there are no local maxima. And because of that, what we find is a certainly a, a proper estimator of the probabilities for the latent variable. So because of uni, we call this unimodality, because of this unimodality of the likelihood, we can find, we can learn in a, this automatic way, the exogenous distribution. And where is the credality? Where are, where are the credits? This is a single one, but you know, the EM need an initialization. You need the two, for instance, a uni, uh, you have to sample the value, the initial value, and then it's an iterative process, which you iterate until convergence. You, with different initialization, generally speaking, you will obtain a different estimates. And these different estimates you can prove are different points of this credit set. So it's like a, I would call it sophisticated sampling scheme for the credit set. Of course, this is an inner approximation. We have the true credit set and we are finding point inside the credit set. The good news is that we have a result about uh, credible intervals for this approach. So with a relatively few iteration, few in run, few EM run, we obtain a good inner approximation. So we cover, we obtain a good description of the, of the interval. And so this is a, our approximate approach. Now, let me be quick. Let me go back to this example. And this was an application uh, it's a bit sad example, but okay, <laughs> it's the, but it's the, it's the best we have, I think. Uh, 
That it was uh, was a lot of, of work. Basically, this is an, an hospice is for uh, ear cancer. Uh, is a place uh, near our east in Switzerland, and actually they they do palliative care to uh, <coughs> to uh, to people with, with with cancer. They were able. They have a lot of data, and they were able to describe a causal model for this. And there are, but, and the point is whether or not for these people makes more sense to to die at home or to die in the in the hospital depending also on the different intervention they can do on different factors and our point was to use the data observation but we have a causal graph for that and our point was basically to see which one are the most important factors in affecting these uh, these results so we use this counterfactual probability which is the probability of necessity and sufficiency and in this way, we managed to prove, to prove, to compute that uh, the fact that uh, the, the activity of this uh, association was crucial, basically, in deciding the value of this variable. And this, okay, I'm not entering the detail, but as a sum of consequence at the political level and so on. It's a very simple example. Of course, the machinery was quite complicated. We had a graph. We don't have the equation, the structural equation, there are conservative ways to, to learn the, the, the equation, but this means very large cardinalities of the variable, so it was complicated from a computational point of view. But this is just to say that in, in spite of the credulity, the intervals, we can have clear conclusions. So this interval is clearly strong. In, uh, this factor is clearly stronger than this factor, even if we have only an interval estimate. And we have an interval estimate not because of our fault. We have an interval estimate because these models are intrinsically imprecise, intrinsically intervaluable. Interval so, let, okay, then we focused on data with bias, but basically we obtained the similar result. We generalized the same result to bias data. So, to when some of the data are not available for some reason, these are technical results. We are now working with hybrid data, so we collect, I don't know, an observational study and a, a clinical trial, and we want to merge together the knowledge. And still, we, we are always proving the same theorem, but in, uh, in more just extended setup. And what, what we are really trying to do in these uh, months is to use some technique for knowledge compilation from uh, circuits, probabilistic circuits, this kind of approach, to speed up the inference. So we had the, some one order of magnitude uh, uh, speed up. That's it. I will say maybe now is uh, if you have questions, it's interesting to answer question. This I can tell you something later. This is the QR code with the slides. <laughs> if you if you might, this is my mail. Don't hesitate to if you have uh, any interest, any curiosity. I'm very happy happy to answer, and uh, I'm very happy to answer question now if if you have. Thank you. <laughs> Hope it works, the QR code. Uh, my, I think so. <laughs> so, Alison, how, how big are the models you can handle? So, this, this model with the hospice data, this is a relatively large one? Yeah, but you know, the, the point is, is not uh, necessarily the, the, the number of variables. We can also go with very large. The, the model, the, the, the real point is the, the, the number of parents. Uh, it's complicated. There are many factors. If you don't know the equation, the number of parents matters a lot. So here, for instance, here we have a, a variable with four parents. Uh, for a vision network, it's not that much. We have two to the power of four uh, the joint configuration of the parents. But then when you have to compute the equations, is two to the power of four, two, two to the power of four. Uh, this was, no, sorry. Four, it uh, was two to the power of 16, which is 64, uh, 65,000 states of a Latin variable, of the U variable, let's say like that. We managed, but was uh, complicated. And you did these calculations with uh, credit G? Yeah, 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 exactly. In a, uh, and then, uh, let's say, in these models, there is a lot of room for parallelization. So you can also, okay, we are speeding up. So no, just, just what I wanted to say is that it's not only the number of variables. Maybe you, you, you might have a model with lots of variables, but different parts will, uh, will decompose and you can compute one independently of the other. 
One point, of course, is the number of, of parents if you don't have the equation. The other point is the confounders. So you have a confounder where you have an added variable, which is a parent of two endogenous variables. A single confounder is okay, but it's somehow connected. If you have a lot of confounder connecting everything with everything, of course, the inference uh, becomes. Uh, and uh, Darvish is defining this new concept of causal three width, which is, and let's say, inference is exponential in the causal three width, basically. I have a question. <coughs> I might have not understood um, right, but about the 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 result that you got about unimodality in mm -hmm. yeah. Can you give like an intuition why that's true? Because that's oh. really surprising for me. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, maybe you say that it's surprising because it, is a, oh, it was also surprising to me because we have to say that, that missingness makes the likelihood uh, multimodal. So if you have a complete data set, you know that the likelihood is as a single maximum is a concave function with a single maximum. And we study, we know, we know that, that every time you put a missingness, uh, everything becomes, uh, let's, let's say, uh, everything uh, becomes multimodal. One intuition is that the, the, the missingness is in top level, so there is a clear separation between the variables that are missing, which are topologically before the variables that are not missing. You see? Not sure this is <laughs> convincing you, let me try in this way, otherwise, uh, okay, so this is the thing of the uh, unimodality. If you marginalize out the missing variables, you obtain a model, an observable model, and for this model, you have unimodality because it is uh, it's, uh, like you have complete data. Okay. So this can be a kind of, of, of intuition. So it's a more complicated function, but uh, let's say if you project this is more complicated variable in a higher dimensional space, so only to the observable variables, you have unimodality. And somehow it's like each point of this uh, unimodal uh, in the observable space dilates in a set of points because you have different U giving to the same point, you see. So the, the, this is, uh, you see, the, the area where are the, the, the global maximum is uh, what, what we call a plateau. So it's a, it's a concave region but it's a region. In, if you project everything on the X space, you have a single point. So it's like this single point expand, but it remains flat. It's not a big intuition, <laughs> but uh, somehow, somehow I think it's something like that. Right, thank you. Please, please. Uh, in complex dynamic systems, you have a lot of data and a lot of results connected by a bunch of equations mm -hmm. that not always makes some total sense, generally speaking. So my question is, uh, with this model, we, we can somehow uh, connect the dots between the data and the outcome of a model, for instance, uh, global warming. Mm -hmm. you have the atmospheric dynamics, and we have a lot, a lot of interfering dynamics in a bunch of scales, uh, and you have a problem that's global warming. So, to an output like in rain, amount of rain someplace, you can, it's really, really difficult to establish a causal chain between those those data you have and the final results increasing in rain, mm -hmm. increasing temperature, etc. With this model, we, you, we could somehow you know, provide some more interpretability to this to the results. It's a difficult question. Uh, in general, for sure, I cannot answer, but uh, now let me say that there are many aspects. One of, of course, in dynamical model ER, these are static models, so I'm not describing time. Yeah. It can be done. It yeah. can be that people working in this direction, you know, will be natural. I don't know if you're familiar with dynamic uh, graphical model where basically you have the slice T and the slice T plus one. You assume some kind of Markovianity, so you just need to know about it. So 
one, one step is time. But let's for the moment ignore uh, time. If you are uh, if you have the problem that your structural equation are wrong, I, I don't see uh, a clear a clear solution uh, to, to that. What we have, for instance, we had a Stokes equation. Sorry, we had a Stokes equation. If you look, hmm. at least thinking, if you can solve. Never stop the equation, you can integrate in time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have the state of the climate. Mm -hmm. oh. But we don't. We really don't. Don't because you, you cannot solve it? Or? Because it's not solvable. Like, ah, okay. A risk is not solvable. You know. Only it's one of the remaining problems. Okay, not sure. Uh, this, uh, some people is, uh, is trying to, uh, one of them is this Baron Boy, I guess, Baron Boy, is trying to replace the spatial equation with neural networks. Yeah. So basically, you these branches are neural networks. So you learn the equation somehow from from the data, and you can relatively easily embed these into this uh, machinery. Then I think the other point you mentioned is that okay, you cannot say which is the cause. These models are intended to tell you which is the strongest uh, ca the, the causal effect, uh, which has the, the strongest influence. But uh, they rely on, on the causal graph. So first. Uh, you need to learn somehow from an expert knowledge or whatever a, a, a directed graph that describes the, the, the causal relation between your variables, which is another open problem for these uh, these guys. So this is a uh, we are trying, for instance, uh, we're using now chat GPT for medical domain. We give a text and we try to learn the causal graph uh, with chat GPT or this kind of stuff, but. This is another problem. <laughs> so I think so your problem is very complicated. <laughs> so actually, there is a question in, no. the, uh, in the audience, in the remote mm -hmm. audience, uh, by uh, Fernando Zorio. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, similar to the relationship uh, to the, to the answer you just gave. It's related to time and mm -hmm. dynamic systems. So the question is: Do causal relations change over time? For example, as the present context changes, as time goes by, uh, the relations can also change. Can we change from one causal model, causal network to another one? So that's it. This is even more complicated because this point was just embedding uh, time in the dynamical model, but assuming a constant causal mechanism. Uh, this I never, I never saw something that I understand that the point is non-stationary causal mechanism. I would say it's very complicated. You can try to. To model, but uh, it's at least two steps <laughs> beyond what uh, what we are doing now. So for me now, something like that would be very complicated at, the, at this stage, and, and I haven't seen something like that. Uh, but I understand the motivation, but uh, sorry, uh, I'm not a user. <laughs> uh, yeah. Please. Uh, a more general question: Can this model facilitate uh, the question of interpretability of IA? Uh, uh, yeah. I would say yes. I would say yes. I, don't, I would say that this is a trend. You know, also in exp XI started some some time ago, and what people started to do was observational explanation. I don't know if you use tools, you know, tools like Lime. Sharp, Sharp is a bit different, but Lime basically they work very well in the sense that you they, they are model agnostic. You can use them. You can find them, but they are not really let's say. They, they might suffer from the same problem you remember this cholesterol example. So in the explanation, the explanation can be can be wrong. This is at least is my, my 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 opinion. Now people is trying to do a causal explanation. Is also what we are doing with some uh, with some students and what we call a counterfactual explanation. So the, the idea of counterfactual explanation is that okay, my classifier gave me this answer and the feature was like that. What would be what would happen if the feature is different? And this is intrinsically counterfactual. Some people is, is trying to answer the same question, but uh, <laughs> is what they call a contrastive. The contrastive is just to say, I compute the, the output of the classifier with this feature, line somehow is doing that. I, I compute with this feature, I change the feature, and I see the difference. But this is not a genuine counterfactual. And from some perspective, this might be wrong. Uh, acting counterfactual is more a uh, sound approach to me. Mm -hmm. please. Could you please explain again the hierarchy that you put the machine learning, deep learning below, and then reinforcement ah. learning in the middle? And what do you mean with 
with that. Yeah, yeah, but let's say it's not uh, and the art importance, art. but uh, let's say the, 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 idea, yeah, the, the idea is to learn a uh, 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 deep learning. But, uh, and what is the relationship of what you are proposing? Okay, no, we, we, we are there on the top. Ah, yeah, no, 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 by the way, we try to be here, but to be here, we want the, we are coping with continuous variable, everything very, very, very simple. Machine learning is down, but it's doing super sophisticated stuff, so it's, it's really my, okay, this is a uh, for, for, for them. No, my point here is just that machine learning and deep learning is here because it's based on observational data. So what you can learn is just the correlation between variables. You can do predictions, Okay, but this prediction has no causal flaw. So uh, I, I know that if I observe this, it's very likely that it will be it will be this, and that's it. In practice, this is super useful, super powerful, but it is just that. Intervention reinforcement learning is here if you want, because you do an action, and doing an action is not like doing a, a, an observation. So in this sense, reinforcement learning is, is there. Elias is working on this. Right? On this, on this. Ah, <laughs> Elias is working everywhere, basically. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, the, in fact, he's doing stuff about reinforcement learning with causal oh, interpretation, yes. which to me makes a lot of sense. But it's, it's complicated, of course. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Is there a conceptual difference between Finding out what happens when you do an action and finding out what happens when you observe an action is done. Yes, yes sir. and you, I don't have a, a good example already, but I can uh, I can build a, a super small model where the probability of uh, x given y is different from the probability of x given do y. So the you see. It's, it's like the probability that you you, uh, you, you, uh, you 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 get sick if I don't give you the aspirin. No, if I observe that you didn't uh, add the aspirin, and the probability uh, this is mis misleading uh, example. But my my point is that we are interested in doing prediction. Okay, we are interested in the target variable. Okay. Uh, our prediction is based on some information. If this information is the result of an observation, this is the, the second scenario you, you mentioned. If this, uh, uh, this information you collect is the result of an action in which I forced you to, to take the drug or whatever, the two probabilities in general will be different. You know, maybe... It, 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 <laughs> Uh, I don't. I know that this might, might be might be surprising, but uh, okay. How okay, can uh, please? This is very much related to what we do in belief revision. Mm, and yeah, yeah, exactly, that's exactly. The idea. So when you have an action, you're changing the models. If you're observing, you're just changing the information you have about the models. So this is if you are observing, you are not changing the world. Mm -hmm. You just seeing more things about the world as it was. But then if you, if you perform an action, then you're changing really. So it's a different kind of knowledge that you get. You have to update all the models you have before. You know, the fact that you take a drug according to this for, is the result of a function uh, that, um, I don't know, you, you went to the doctor or you read something on a newspaper. And uh, I override that because I just force you to take the drug. And the, this is, for instance, the difference between this observational study and uh, clinical trials. In clinical trials, they, they give, <laughs> and this makes a lot of difference for the, for the study. My answer was not perfect. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, but you, you can form a problem. Right? You can really you know, in a super small example, which I don't have now. Sorry. <laughs> Ah, okay, James, I think I've had okay, so time uh, for people that are still here, they can still mm -hmm. talk to Alessandro. So let's thank Alessandro again. Thank you. Thank you guys. It was very nice. <laughs> 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 <laughs>